Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Troy, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm gonna today's Bible text will be included in the sermon, uh, so I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, so this is uh, July 14th, 2024, and at 6:15 p.m. yesterday, we were reminded that people murder other people. I assume you know the basic story. In Butler, Pennsylvania, a 20-year-old man attempted to assassinate Donald Trump and missed by inches, grazing the former president's ear. As tends to happen when we resort to violence with firearms, one bystander was murdered in the attempt, and as of this morning, two are hospitalized in critical condition. And then the shooter himself was shot and killed. My read of the press coverage is that this is shocking to us. In many ways, that is good. I am heartened that we are shocked. Shock can be a catalyst for positive change. In other ways, I don't see any reason for us to be shocked. My congregation often hears me pray for the three major hot wars in the world today, with the mass casualties, the mass displacement of people and mass misery from grief, disease, and malnutrition. Ukraine, Palestine, and Sudan are not good places to be in 2024. I also did a casual Google search and uh, looking for murders in the USA on Saturday, July 13th, 2024. And here are a few hits that came up. Birmingham, Massachusetts. A drive-by shooting at an adult birthday party left four people dead and nine others injured. Police said, we're unsure what led to the incident and whether someone was targeted. Tampa, Florida. County Sheriff's Office has arrested a man that murdered two people and then fled from deputies. Portland, Oregon. Two men were shot to death at a Portland boat ramp early Saturday evening, police said. The shooter or shooters remain at large and the investigation is active and ongoing. Chicago. At least 13 people have been shot, two fatally, in shootings across Chicago so far this weekend, the police said. Uh, that was as of 4 p.m. on Saturday for a weekend statistic. All this makes me think that the basics are important. So it might be a good time to review the Ten Commandments. Do remember that they are given after God rescues the people from slavery in Egypt and protects them from the Egyptian military by bringing them through the Red Sea. I'm going to read Exodus 21 through 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. This is an important commandment to we Presbyterians. We have always pointed out that not all idols are of physical things. Sometimes they are ideas some notion that we take to ourselves that becomes all important and all consuming. It becomes our God. I continue at verse five, you shall not bow down to idols or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, or your son, or your daughter, or your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and consecrated it. Honor 
your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that your Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. It's always tricky to know how to translate this. One could make a good case for you shall not kill, but as soon as one says that, we all come up with justifications that we're sure are good ones for killing, and sometimes they really are. But it's a tricky translation issue, and I don't want you to think that it's some really narrow category called murder. It's bigger than that. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So far, our political narrative around the assassination attempt has been reasoned, compassionate, and unified. I fear that false witness in the form of accusations and recriminations will start flying soon. I hope that events prove me wrong. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. When the Ten Commandments are read or put on posters, usually the context of the Exodus is left out, as are these verses following Moses' presentation of the commandments to the people and the people's subsequent reaction. So let me read that last bit again. Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. See, there's two things here. There's two kinds of fear, right? Don't be afraid, but have the fear of the Lord. Random fear, not helpful. Fear of the Lord, other places in Scripture say, is the beginning of wisdom. We must contemplate God as God. And a strong sense of God's judgment might deter us from sin. I wish that everyone who contemplates murder or every other sin would keenly feel the fear of the Lord and they might not do what they're planning. I'm not really a hellfire and brimstone preacher, but I don't like the afterlife odds for someone who dies immediately after murdering people. Murderers not only break God's commandment, they harm, harm something that is precious to the Lord. One of God's children and we are all so deeply loved. God is quite jealous about the loss of one of God's own, and God's wrath can last for generations. Let's shift now to Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has no patience with legalism or self-aggrandizement. There is a certain kind of moralistic narrative where people say, Oh, I, I think I live a pretty good life. I, I mean, I haven't murdered anyone. The implication is that they can indulge in whatever impulse they have as long as they don't murder or steal, as if those were the only commandments that really matter. Not good enough for Jesus. The commandments are only parameters. He is looking for people who love God enough to go beyond the rules. Listen to Matthew 5, 21 and 24. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, 
leave your gift there before the altar. Go first and be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come back and offer your gift. See, the goal of human laws is to prohibit lawlessness. The goal of God's law is to help us develop as people that we may experience the wonder of God's sanctification within ourselves. The rules themselves are only a starting point. The hope is to turn us into people who do not so much experience rage, who don't insult other people, who don't even want to call them as something as innocuous as fool. And we show the same concern for the spiritual welfare of others. If we are praying and realize that someone is angry at us, we go. We make an effort to be reconciled. We gradually become the kind of people whose hearts are somewhat like Jesus' heart, who are slow to anger, quick to forgive. This is the goal of the Christian life. All these worship services people come to, all the volunteer work that people do, all the prayers. The hope is that we become more and more like Jesus. So keep up the good work, my friends. Keep the faith. Now let me shift briefly over to the political situation of First and Second Samuel in the Bible. Israel's first king was Saul. He's a farm boy looking for his AWOL donkeys when we first meet him in 1 Samuel 9. No one is more shocked than Saul when he suddenly anointed as king by Samuel and the company of prophets. At first he rises to the occasion very well, but over time he gets a bit full of himself, even usurping Samuel's role at one point. I'm giving the short version here. After Young David gains fame by slaying the giant Goliath. Saul becomes immensely jealous of David. And then Saul gets really out of control. Maybe it was the stress. Maybe it was mental illness. Maybe God was punishing him. But he loses it. One day as David is playing the harp, Saul throws a spear at him. <laughs> David flees. Saul charges some soldiers to hunt David down. And the chase goes on for years. David and his friends have been on the run a long time when he gets a chance to revenge himself on Saul. First Samuel 24, David's hiding in the back of a cave. Saul has to go to the bathroom. So he goes into the cave to do that, not knowing that David is there. David has the perfect opportunity to kill his enemy, but chooses not to. He has every reason to kill but does not. <laughs> Even Saul admits that David is more righteous than Saul is. Well, eventually Saul dies and David becomes Israel's second king. He's a better king than Saul and does a lot of things right. But eventually, good King David arranges for the murder of one of his own soldier, soldiers, Uriah, and so he can cover up his own adultery with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. Now, why am I talking about all this obscure history? It's a very interesting case of people who do or do not choose to commit murder at various moments. But more than that, I think these stories are in the Bible to show us the danger of power. Most people think their lives will improve if they gain power, wealth, and fame. But the Bible shows us just the opposite. Most people's moral character is challenged and weakened by having a lot of power. David was the pinnacle, the golden age of Israel's kings, with the possible exception of, of Solomon. But certainly after Solomon, everything just goes downhill from there. Yet even these first few kings experienced the corrupting influence of power. Power erodes moral character. The founding fathers of our country were well aware of that, which is why they produced a system of checks and balances so we didn't wind up with a king like George III in our executive office. In my view, no one's moral character is improved when they get more power. And I think the Bible backs me up on this one. So 
The best you can hope for is that someone will maintain their current way of life and moral character when they are elected to high office. That's the best possible outcome. And as far as I can tell, no one is improved by getting more power. So look at candidates' histories. Choose carefully and wisely as we enter into this very delicate political season in our nation. Remember that power is so very dangerous and so very intoxicating. Murder, I think, is the attempted shortcut for solving one's problems. Ever since Cain murdered Abel in Genesis 4, people have been tempted to that shortcut. If only so-and-so wasn't around, everything would be better. That was the rationale for those who murdered Jesus. God has a plan for the world where eventually murder and violence will be things of a barely remembered past. God envisions a time when all swords will have been beaten into plow blades and all guns melted down for playground equipment, where lions and lambs, Democrats and Republicans will all eat together, recognizing each other's humanity. God's son was called the Prince of Peace. He will reign over a newborn world where Sudan and Ukraine and Russia and the Holy Land will be at peace. We can't bring that about in the short term, but we can start with thou shalt not murder. And while we're at it, let's try not to deride other people as fools either. I pray, my friends, that God's spirit will be at work within all of us, that we will see that every person we meet is a beloved child of God, and that our actions will be founded in that kind of caring, that kind of respect and even fear of the Lord, and that it will shape our lives and our culture. So if you agree, please pray with me for that. And we better pray really hard because these are tough times. God bless. Amen.